Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we're playing as Valerie Sablin, leading Baratia. Now, I've technically played as Sablin before, but I have heard at the time of this recording that there might be a rework for Sablin, so I figured, you know what, let's have a little bit more fun with Sablin, and let's go a slightly different route for him, and totally go not libertarian socialist, and go more AS. More AS. But we have idealistic revolutionaries as well as the ghost of Bukharin. So because, why not? I want something a little different and, I don't know, there's never enough red leaders. But the Spock. The time has come, comrades. For too long, the tyrant Yagoda sat in his ivory tower while the rest of us starved in the dirt. For too long have the corrupt men of the NKVD prowled the streets, taking our friends and family in the dead of nights, never to be seen again. The will of the avenging proletariat shall put an end to this, led by our comrade in arms, Valerie Salbenfall. It was he who first took a stand, he who first questioned the tyrant, he who looked death in the face and said, Not today, Satan. With the aid of the Virats, our ASSR has been reborn, and together, arm in arm, brothers and sisters, we will let the spark of revolution right under your goddess feet, and when the time comes, he will be consumed in its blaze, in which we're going to go grab what? I like the PP, but I like stability first, of hope. Comrades, our revolution is not the rabid bite of a starving dog, nor the feeble struggle of a doomed man. Our struggle is a glorious one, born from the suffering force upon us by Yagoda and his NKVD. But more than that, it is the embodiment of the unending spirit of hope of the people that one day the struggles will be rewarded, as the struggles will not be in vain to this end. Measures must be done to inspire his hope in those who still <clears throat> fear the wrath of the NKVD. A revolution is nothing without the love and support for those it is fought Cool. But as normal, we begin down here. Hopefully, we do okay here. And I might just eat those words in a few minutes here, or a few seconds, just because I remember this. It's kind of a struggle. But the revolution were born. As the Great Patriotic War shattered the Soviet Union, those who dwelled within the Barat ASSR could not help but fear for the future. Even as Yagoda's evacuated the government of the East, the always looming fear of a Japanese or German strike was ever present. Because of this, we did not complain when Yagoda expanded the NKVD's power emergency measures, he said. We did not complain when the Presidium was purged. Surely Comrade Yagoda had good intentions. Of course, we did not complain when our neighbors were dragged off by the men in the middle of the night, never to be seen again. Surely, they were traitors. When Comrade Yagoda consolidated his grip even further, and men came in the middle of the day, none thought any sane person would have the courage to speak out, and yet still Comrade Sodlin did. Emboldened by Yagoda's resounding defeat in the war with the Central Soviet Republic, he acted. A mere commissar, only 23 years of age, but disgusted by the atrocities he had seen, he and a small amount of men stormed a radio tower and broadcast his message for all to hear. This was not socialism, he said. This was not even a life worth living. Comrade Sodlin uh, called for the press for so long by Yagoda's steel grasp to free themselves to take a stand to tell their oppressors, No. And they did. Comrade Stalin has declared the Berat ASSR born, free from Yagoda's tyranny for the moment. Even now, the NKVD march, determined to slaughter all who stand in their way, but their iron discipline and shedding guns mean nothing. Thanks to Comrade Stalin, we have tasted freedom, and we will die before it is taken from us. The revolution marches on, and we do have a cup of coffee to keep us nice and warm as we are waiting for our soldiers to slowly get to the front lines. Oh my goodness, please guys, please! Give us a little bit more love, but a split in the family. Oh, my calling is to the east, Papa. I'm sorry. Baldurev stared into his son. His face was hard as iron, his eyes a piercing blade. For the briefest moment, he did not know what to say. Ten years he served Yagoda. Ten years he had risen through the ranks of the NKVD. Blood stained his hands, but long had he rationalized it during sleepless nights. It was necessary. It was his duty before that. As a boy of just 17, he fought and bled for the Bolsheviks of the Great Civil War. He promised his life to the revolution until the very end of his days. Now, here was his son, about to betray the nation that Baldurev had a hand in forging. With eyes a pleaded to his father, let me go. Let me fight for what is right. He sighed, setting a hand upon his son's shoulder. I was only a bit younger than you when I too bled for Lenin, he began. In those days, I asked myself one question for every single night. When I was, was I fighting for the right side? What if I had made a horrible, horrible mistake? He shook his head, smiling. I followed what my heart desired. I followed the passion that guided me and led it, and it led me to the socialist revolution. Baldurev swallowed, suddenly uneasy of what he was about to say, no matter who won the struggle. His words would doom him, but a cruel man corrupted him, my son, and they brought me down a path I should have never followed. I am old now, and my passion has dried. His eyes met with the sun's, and tears swell. Follow your heart, my son. Do what you believe is right. Do not be constrained by old, feeble men like me, but... Hold your comrades accountable, as I should have. His son nodded, and the eagerness that filled his face was now mixed with longing. I will, Papa, he said, as he watched his son step out of the house through the Baratia. Baldurev feared that he had killed him, yet he could not restrain his boy like he did so many others. His fate was for himself to choose. Now, there was only one hopeless wish he had left. Please come back home. Oh, no. I read that one before, and oh, boy. Oh, boy. That's all I can say. And you know what I don't like? I don't like militia. Militia units suck. Maybe you both attack. Can you actually win here? If not, 
the Spock. Uh, it's kind of a mixed bag, but two brothers, Alexei and Sergei Maximovich, embrace warmly in the candlelight of the late father's basement. It was just way past curfew, and Sergei had been forced to sneak his way through the slowly abandoned streets of Serovayevsk. By Kusk. Thus, father, a loving but stern man, well respected within Yugoda's party, had died many years earlier. He had left both of his son's keys to the property, and they had come here often since his death to catch up and reminisce, but both of them knew this time was different. They both pulled up chairs and sat across from each other, and poured themselves tall glasses of vodka. I know what you've called me here for, Alexei Sergei began, preempting his brother's pleas. You know what my answer will be. Just hear what I have to say, he replied. His tone laced with sadness. There's no way out of this for you, Rubbles, say I gay. You go is going to crush Sovlin's little rebellion in a matter of weeks. If you walk away now, I can make sure you don't end up in front of a firing squad. Oh, yes, I'm sure I will be able to, you will be able to use your position in the NKVD to get me off, but that represents everything that is wrong with your Gotis regime, Alexei. The NKVD runs rampant, crushing dissent, killing anybody in its path with impunity. Its agents routinely abusing their power for personal gain. Sovlin is right. This is not Lenin and Soviet Union. There has to be a better way. Listen to yourself, Sergei. Your Gota and the NKVD are the only thing that have kept Lenin's, Lenin's USSR alive. You think that the Union would have survived a single year against the warlords of the fascists? If not for your Gota, the NKVD is the only thing keeping our enemies at bay. Whatever you tell yourself to help you sleep at night, Sergei said bitterly, downing his vodka and rising from his chair. Next time we see each other, it'll be as enemies. The brothers parted without another word into the cold Siberian night, has a tale as old as time as Spock. Without breaking his stride, Valery Mikhailovich. Soblin thrust open the doors of the Vanudinsk Opera House, busting through the lobby into the theater. Chairs shoved aside had been transformed into the beating heart of the revolution. Soblin felt the revolutionary fervor electrifying his comrades as they filled the can cavernous space with noise and motion. Could see the zeal in their eyes as they saluted him. Mounting the stage in a single bound, Sobin barely got time to salute the Central Committee before he was lifted off his feet in a bear hug by Mikhail Makib, the enormous Yursin Berat, who commanded the mutinese army. Ah, <gasps> comrade exhaled Makib. As he released Sablin, is the energy not infectious? Smiling bashfully, Sablin glanced over his comrades as they stood around the table in the middle of the stage, raising one eyebrow. His right hand man, or I guess right hand woman, Susanna Pichuro, smiled back at him as her inseparable companion, Maya Olanskaya. A frown, irritated by the distraction, not looking up as he scrawled over the map in front of him. The craggy old German Otto Braun grumbled. I believe we agreed that this meeting would uh, begin over half an hour ago, Comrade Sablin. Sauntering over with Mahiv. Sablin looked over the chaotic jumble of maps. Most were pre-war and had been hastily altered to reflect the grim realities of a shattered Russia. Shrug, shudder rugging of a brief pang of melancholy. Sablin grinned to his friends. <sighs> Comrades, the great work continues. As we free ourselves of Yagoda's oppression, so too do I shrug off the tyranny of the clock. Braun shot Soblin's a look of irritated sufferance over the rims of his spectacles. Despite his jocularity, doubt gnawed at Soblin's heart. To prevail over the tyrant Yagoda, he had to be sure they had the will of the people. Comrades began, do the people truly favor us? We cannot win this war without the common folk united under our banner. Putting down his pen, Braun still looked Soblin in the eye. In my years of China, in China, I learned to tell what the people think of the ruler. They hate Yagoda's reign of terror. Suddenly pensive, Mahiv nodded, adding, I can say with certainty that the Biot people are with us, comrade. Valera, our spark has been lit, the flame burning in the people's hearts. They are with us and no other, said Pachuro, smiling slightly. Doubt squashed. Soblin nodded, letting his comrades get back to the down and dirty aspects of the revolution. Spock. He liked that. Sometimes history needs a little push. Nice. Hopefully, we do okay here, because I did I did want to tab over, and I did to see where we were at in terms of strength compared to uh, Yagoda, and let's just say, um, they, they start off with four divisions, so they got a lot of manpower like us, sort of, so they, they, they have about four-ish, four-ish, maybe five, I'll flip them. Um, I do want to get some political power, are we losing stuff every day? Yes, we are, oh my goodness, that's so bad. Manpower, uh, ooh, uh, the factory would be really good, so, libertarian socialism, um, combat rules of anger, I like that one. I like the more guns. Getting more war support would be very good as well. Division organization. Uh, that's not great. I don't mind that one, though. No need for fear of anger. Well, comrade. Oh. Uh, you know what we're losing? Of equality. We're going to be equality first just because I want to get that political power. It is not just the men of the Birat ASSR that fight for the freedom, comrades. All brave sons and daughters of the revolution fight together in the struggle against the tyrants, as the great architects of socialism desired. Arm in arm, working men and women will liberate themselves from Yagoda's vicious gaze, while women in our makeshift army are currently restricted to nurses and scouts. Comrade Salvin has begun to push for women reforms in these policies. Every man or woman will do their share to liberate Baratia. Um, are you actually literally taking that? Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Actually, you hold in. Figure out where you need to go. Um, because they just start, they start stacking here a little bit more. You can probably help beat them up maybe a little bit too, perhaps? And since you're here too. Yeah, those guys are pretty gosh darn tough, so let's not waste lives like that. Um, let's see what happens. No. Okay, so, no. All you guys know. 
you need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that. Because when they start making moves, they might try to encircle us, literally. So we'll see, and we'll try to re-encircle them as well. Oh, uh, we can push out the modern book of tier. If you want to read about that, please go right ahead. Good an eye on them. I do not like these divisions. I honestly prefer these divisions, like, all these militia guys, just, I don't even want them. Yeah, I don't care if we don't have material anyway, so, seriously, just, just, just convert them over. You might as well at this point. They're very weak. They look very weak, but they're literally just as strong as a militia, so it is what it is. Of hope. Of equality. Let them come in. Oh, here we go. So we're going to do this. They're going to encircle us here probably too, so that's fine. The de Red Dead Revolution. Mikhail Mahib whooped and waved his battered old saber in the air as his cavalry thundered across the taiga. A huge cloud of dust rising in the wake as he charged towards the great train. His men let loose their war cries, bullets tore through the air towards them, responding with a blistering fusillade that sent the screaming defenders toppling the, from the train. This was living. This is what men were made for. Mahib joined his men as they drew alongside the train, leaping from their horses to the cargo strewn flat cars. Fountains of gore spilling from the guards not seen or not smart enough to jump off and make a run for it. Forward men, show these plunders of the fury of the Birats for the revolution, shouted Mahib, pulling his revolver and sprinting down the train towards the engine, bombarding their defenders with a hail of bullets. Reloading behind an enormous crate stamped with Chinese characters, Mahib felt the train speed up beneath him. The desperate engineer stuck in the boiler to try and escape. Too late, he thought. Grinning vi viciously as he fired wildly out from cover, a spray of blood erupting from the head of one of his enemies. Ah, what a righteous feeling. To spill the blood of plunders and black marketers in the service of the revolution. Despite the glories of battle, Mahib had to admit that the result was a foregone conclusion. His troop outnumbered the defenders 5-1, to one, and by the time they reached the front, the, uh, they reached the front, the suit-smeared engineers had their hands up in a terrified su surrender. So, the tyrant Yugoda thought he could just control the railways, did he? He'd have a heck of a lot more trouble suppressing the revolution without his regular weapons shipment coming up from China. Mahib sneered as one of his greedy men handed him a bottle of expensive wine intended for the tyrant himself. Uh, he uncorked it with his teeth and took a swig, taking, taking it from Yugoda made it all the sweeter. Forward for the revolution. Uh, we probably want more war support. I definitely want to get more war support so we get some more guns. While well, Comrade Salvin's reforms and dreams are a revolution in and of themselves, we must not forget our war is not one of gradual talent reform, but a bitter fight for survival justice itself. Throughout the ASSR, there's not one man, woman, or child that has not felt the bitter sting of loss. All felt the bite, cold bite of the NKVD's perverted mockery of justice. This, comrades, is the greatest reason for our struggle. We're not only fighting for a better world, we are fighting only... We are not only fighting for a better union, we fight for a better survival already. Partisans lose their lose their fury upon the NKVD, and if we are to ever defeat the tyrants, we can do nothing but intensify these attacks. We will be the agents <clears throat> of justice that avenge all those the NKVD have wronged. So get in there as fast as we can, and we're going to try to encircle and kill them off. Sh oh, Shpia has been named successor, huh? Now they're coming in here too, which is a bad idea, but if I can kill off that motorized, that'd be so good. Oh. Oh boy. Don't let them through. Do not let them through. There you go. Go in. Actually, don't even go in. Just help hold the attack. There we go, there we go. Oh, this is really dangerous to let them come in. We'll see, we'll see. Let everyone help out and participate. Good. Come on, baby boy, come on. Oh, it's not good, it's not good. Of equality, of anger. I mean, if it goes poorly for us, then I'll, I'll probably just do some stuff off screen, but still. I don't want to kill these guys off, but like, at the same time, we gotta get these guys to move, 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 move. Um, the propaganda offensive. It was anything but funny. And, yet. Gunovich could hardly contain his laughter. It, had, it all happened so fast. Mom, one moment, he sat in his dilapidated chair, enjoying a precious commodity he had secretly uncovered, a cigarette. Next, he found himself prone. His body hypnotized and muscle memory forged by the remnants of the Luftwaffe terrorism in the war. This time, however, no distant booms accompanied the sound of engines, simply a soft whoosh, and then silence, as others slowly uncoiled themselves from fetal positions and emerged from the various shackles they had cowered in. They stared at the commanding officer, who was now hysterical. Pamphlets, he shouted from the bouts of absurd laughter. The dudes had sent us regarding material. Reading material. The quiet tension broke as the people milled her out the courtyard again. Some cried, having felt a yet another brave brush with the end. Others returned to their duties, long used to such close calls. Gunovich shuffled through the wet paper at his feet before picking one up to examine. A few others did the same. The Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics is prepared to grant amnesty to all persons who renounce this so-called Salvanet Rebellion. We, the Presidium, urge individuals who possess pertinent information and a sense of patriotism to travel to the city of Irkutsk. Failure to comply with this directive will be viewed as a traitorous act against the people and the motherland and prosecuted to the fullest extent. Gunovich crumpled the paper in his hands and stormed off towards the nearest building to convene, convene with Salvan. It was now apparent that not even the skies themselves were safe from NKVD indoctrination. We must hope you will heed our message. Yeah, not today, son. Not today weird. Uh, but honestly, like, they should be losing a lot more strength than this. What do they have on there? They have 52% attrition. They have literally motorized recon. That is insane. 
You're not done. You gotta keep attacking. Get some more organization. Do not go Oh my god, don't go that way. Of anger. So we get some more wars, but there's good for the lost. Comrades, how many sons have wept in the dead of night, wondering if they will ever see their father's face again? How many wives walk the street in silence, alone with no consol cons consolation? How many parents have felt a part of themselves die with their children? The extent of your good as crimes are immeasurable and unforgivable. We'll never see the faces of those lost, but we will find justice for them. Oh, I forgot about this. My apologies. Um, good. Warlord development. We're not going to do that one. So, cool. Followed up with. Answer for them the crimes. Um, I don't want to lose more organization. And you get 5% back, so you lose 5%. And you get more recovery and attack, not bad for the future. Uh, manpower, we don't really need more. We will need more, but I don't want to get in that one, so for the future. The revolution will not end when you go to falls, and make no mistake, comrades. He will fall, but we cannot make the same mistakes he, or Comrade Dlenin and Comrade Bukharin did before us. That mistake, comrades, is to not have a clear vision for the post-revolution. If we are not disciplined, here and now, marching to a single victory for all, we will lose our way, just as those before us were prone to do. Ever so slowly, the roots of the un new union begin to take shape, cautiously, slowly, but full of determination. Comrade Solomon is not a dictator nor a king. We do not fear him. We are not his slaves. No, we follow him because we believe in what he stands for. Our collective hope and determination will be the tender that ignites the fires of the Soviet Phoenix. Okay, so now they're dead. Thank God. Um, cool. That's good. Actually, so we've lost quite a few guys. But not nearly as much as he has. That's really good. Uh, expand out. Expand out. Oh, oh, that's just one tile. It's not good. It's kind of hard to see some of the tiles, man. It's kind of a little hard to see. So we can get up there. That'd be great. We can get these tiles back. It doesn't really matter to me too much. My main goal is to make sure that we kind of hold here. Save up to two divisions up top, which is actually really good. Really, really good. Come back over here. Bait him in. Bait him in. Hey, nice job, guys. Nice job. Get over that river, because hopefully we'll try to make another encirclement. And... Hello. I mean, obviously we're very weak, but still. For those lost. For the future. Officers abducted. Colonel Popov stood down to the stained and outdated map that laid before him, trying to sort this mess out. Ever since his defection from the NKVD, he had been trying his best to lend his talents to the mutineers and show them how a war was supposed to be fought. Perhaps it should, wouldn't have been such a challenge if they weren't young enough to be Popov's children. Getting these youngsters to work with any kind of cohesion has proved to be more difficult than the Colonel has ha, would have ever expected. What are we waiting for? The Tyrant's goons lie in wait just beyond that ridge. I said, heck with all this. We should head over there and kick some booty. A young spirited officer said, trying to win over the cramped room with his bluster. Papa found himself getting ready to respond, but a muffled noise from outside distracted him from the uh, moment. Glancing at the window, all he could see was a furious Siberian winter continuing its assault on the glass panes. Perhaps it was just the wind. And what is your plan once we get over there? One of the other officers asked. Charge into the lines and die like idiots, Papa heard it again. And this time it was closer. The howling wind made it difficult to determine what it was. Well, we have to do something. I've been freezing my... The brash young officer was cut off by the sound of the door being violently kicked open. Papa felt his heart leap out of his chest as he turned his attention to the door. Four imposing figures, wearing white camouflage coats and brandishing assault rifles, began loudly demanding everyone in the room to surrender their arms. His heart sank as he recognized the badge on their hats. The NKVD has come for them. I'll never surrender, you dudes, the young officer boldly shouted at the assailants as he drew his sidearm. He scarcely had the chance to aim before the soldiers unleashed a vicious storm of lead, gutting down every man in the room besides Papa. Ears ringing in a vision blurred by the man by the blood of his comrades, the disoriented colonel felt his knees give in. The last thing he remembered seeing that night was the attacker's shadows looming closer and closer. Don them, don them all. Nothing to lose but your chains. Come, comrades. Join our righteous struggle. Dream of a world in which no man is a slave, no man is subjected to the cruel whip or the bullet. A world where democracy and the workers come before all. Oh, oh, we can make this world a reality, comrades. All we need is your strength, your anger, and your hope. Join with us, comrades, and together we will save the motherland from the strife that engulfs it and usher in a new age of peace and, of course, prosperity. Good, you made it here. So they leave. If we can get there faster, that'd be nice, but still, we'll see. Um, they're not doing anything down here, which is okay. How are we losing here and not winning here enough? My goodness. Here, attack you too. We're losing here, but we're barely winning here. Bruh. Can you guys actually win here? Doesn't look like it. Nope. You actually lost. That is so sad. For the future, nothing to lose but your chains. <clears throat> Keep it up, boys and girls. Um, they have really strong divisions, but we'll see how long they can last. Uh, equipment. We love equipment, my friends. We love it. 
Um, hmm. I don't want to lose political power. Manpower is nice. Not super necessary, but I'd like it. Fresh our stability and worth part two. Four families. What, a, what, without a family to love and true friends to rely on, what good is life? Comrades seldom speeches emphasize the important role of the family within a socialist life. When not bogged down by oppressive tradition, love of family can be perhaps this, be the strongest purpose, and as Comrade Salvin's learned from his own, the strongest motivation. Our partisans do not fight only for themselves, but for those that love them. And the simple truth is why we will triumph over the NKVD in the end. We're not slaves to the presidiums of bureaucracy or the terror of the NKVD's securocracy, but willing defenders of those we do love. How are you losing in both areas? You guys suck. So hard. That sucks. That's so bad. Fine, get back here then. Get out. Did you seriously win? Cool, you actually won. Nice. You guys actually won. Go figure. Well, they're busy here. Go that direction. See what we can do. Get over the river you can. That'd be very nice. Oh, off families. Can you just just go? Just 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 be gaming, man. Alright, you gotta get two guys there. Um as long as they want to stay there, I'm I'm okay with that. We can't beat them, but maybe they can't beat us either. So we'll see. They're not moving, not moving, moving and grooving. I mean Boom 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 boom. Uh you guys go here. I want you guys to go down here. Attack for now. Uh, let's see. If we could just go here, that'd be great. That would quite literally be great. Keep it up. And if these guys start moving, we gotta get out of there, so. You guys are standing still. Not bad. Not great, but not bad. We need just a little bit more time. Come on, move, 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 move. There you go. This guy's been cut off now, which is nice. Um. Our families. Oh, do they actually encircle us? Look at that. Broadcast a message. One of the greatest advantages of the ASSR's disposal is the radio towers scattered across the broad landscape. Instruments with which we can inform our populace and the enemy of the revolution. Our second greatest weapon is Comrade Stalin himself. With his speeches, his passion, and rousing, none will be able to deny that we're fighting for a just and fair cause. Comrade Stalin will make nightly radio addresses to the people, keeping them informed on the fight and rallying the cause around him. With this powerful tool, we will ensure that all will be on the side of the revolution. Wait, do it? They get another division out? Oh, that is not good. Uh, you all. Uh... Break down. Hold. You get hold. You go on straight for goods. I want you to go here, here. Uh to here to here to here. If we cut that guy out, that'd be great. Keep going, keep going, keep going. If you need that's not too bad. Ba ba da ba 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 ba. Hopefully we do okay. Uh, what was the next one? Broadcast message. Uh, the dreams of those before. A seemingly forgotten aspect of the October Revolution was a strong focus on women's rights. As Lenin wrote, then discussing the new Bolshevik Russia, we're bringing the women into the social economy, into legislation and government. We must follow in his example. As of now, women serve to, next to men in the armed forces, although behind the front lines they are still stifled by the same oppressive traditions as elsewhere in the motherland. Something Comrade Thalbin wishes to succeed on to his end. This end. Social programs will be created to rapidly give women a bigger role in the ASSR's wartime economy. And Comrade Salvin works day and night with his cabinet to drop a plan for the more elaborate social reforms. The ASSR will not be a beacon of bigotry and tradition, but of glorious progress. Oh, come on, baby. Let's keep going. Keep going. Oh, they're attacking us here. That's not good. Oh, they're moving out. They're going to try to kill us, too. Oh, boy. Cut them off. Why are these guys not moving? I seriously don't understand. Um... If we go here and then come back up here, we should have enough time to get Irkutsk as well. Oh, hello. Hello there. Nice. Good. Hold on to there. Come on. Keep moving. Keep moving. You've got to take this. You've got to go now. Hey, they're going to that. Please go ahead. Boom. Not bad. Seriously, you guys suck so hard. I, I never understood a group how they can suck this hard. And we lost it. Well, I don't understand why the AI is not moving their motorized at all, but whatever. What happened? And oh, Croatian Autumn. Those are dream of those dreams of those before. 
and the will of us today. Uh, let's do for the forsaken. Yeah. The Barats are benefactors and comrades who have felt their own share of tyranny, discriminated against by Yagoda's government under the thin guise of opposing reactionary groups, clearly a simple ruse designed to hide their racism. Under Comrade Salvin, however, such things will not be tolerated. Orders have been given for the Barats to be treated entirely equally to Russians and other minority groups, including the small number of Jews in ranks. If we ought to create a truly equal society, we must indeed treat our fellow men. Fellow men. Like men. There we go. Girls with guns. We got them. We did it. We got it, my friends. Boots thumping on the cracked marble tiles, Salva made his way through one of the Opera House's labyrinthine corridors. As always, he went in through without bodyguards. Unlike the tyrant Yagoda, Salva didn't live in fear of one of his own men sinking a knife in his back. Nevertheless, he flinched as Pichiro and Olanoskaya swept out of a room as he passed, stopping him in his tracks. Susanna, Maya, what are the ladies of my heart working on this late at night? He asked, his grin facing, or fading as he saw the severity of their expressions. Valera, Maya and I have been talking, said Pachuro, and we insist on a change of policy. We must allow women to serve on the front line if the revolution is to triumph. Stonily, Olanovskaya added, Indeed, Comrade Salva, and Mahiv complains day and night of not having enough soldiers. Women may hold a gun the same as any other. So why are we restricted to only serving as nurses? For a moment, Salva was speechless. He had never believed in the old idea that a woman's place was a home. But the front line? I don't know of comrades. I believe in the liberty of women, but is combat the best way for women to serve the revolution? Olanskaya moved closer to Seldom. Fire in her eyes. Do not Lenin and Mox before him state that the revolution cannot be accomplished without women? Comrade Seldom, the women of Russia, wish nothing more than to take up service or take up arms in defense of the revolution. Seldom couldn't deny that she made a very good point, and they knew they were low on soldiers. Very well, comrades, grinned Seldom as he looked between the two women. Convene the Central Committee if Russia's women wish to fight alongside their husbands and sons, who am I to stand in their way? Oh, who needs stability? The success of the revolution depends on the extent to which women take part in it. Ooh, that is painful. No need for fear. All too often. Our force is liberated with a sediment with or liberty a settlement or town only be met with the terrifying pleas of its inhabitants begging for the homes and lives in this we see Yagoda's most insidious weapon propaganda in the minds of the lost souls within Akutsk the ASS ASSR is not a liberating force it is an army of brigands rapists and killers only out to plunder the riches and destroy the socialist paradise comrade Yagoda has worked so hard to build of course this is utter nonsense but those living under the yoke cannot must not be blamed for their ignorance we must make efforts to spread the news of our true intentions to the people wiping the mist away from their eyes and exposing Yagoda for the traitor and monster he truly is Oh, look at our national spirits. Hmm. Not bad, but an end to tyrants. On the stage of the Opera House, Valerie Salvin sat with the Central Committee, everyone waiting avidly for the latest report from the front line. Finally, the radio operator head. Salvin could read the message in the glimmer of her eyes and began to smile before she'd even spoken. Comrades, she bellowed, the tyrant is ours. Instantly, the crowd erupted into euphoria. Crowd soldiers hugged one another, tears streaming down their faces as the reports came in. Yogoda in prison, the enemy fleeing west, and the NKVD surrendering en masse. Salvin couldn't help but grin. Akutsk was theirs. Mahi stomped across the stage and thumped a crack of a crate of vodka on the table. From my private stash, if we ever had a cause for celebration, this is it. Snatching a bottle out of the crate, he tossed it to Salvin, laughing with his comrades. He chugged from the bottle, splashing some on the maps heaped on the table. Comrades called Salvin, drawing every eye to him. The revolution is victorious, he cried, waving the bottle like a baton to a cacophonous cheering. Tonight we celebrate. My comrades rejoice, sitting down. He looked around happily. Mahi was joking with his men. Olenovskaya down glass after glass of vodka. Even Brown was smiling for once. Catching Pichiro's eye, Salvin shot her a smile. She grinned back at him, raising her glass in a mock salute. We did it, Valera, she shouted, already slurring. Uh, Salvin smirked. She'd always been a lightweight. Digging another pool, Salvin felt lighter than air. They still had a long road to go down to end Russia's chaos and bring her people into a new age of greatness. But the revolution could wait until tomorrow. Tonight, they had painted Venudinsk red. In the end, tyrants always fall. Always. Times by call. People's Revolutionary Council. Oh boy, which one do we want? Hmm. Five to seven. Or Cheetah, two to four. I mean, they're not terrible over there. If anything, uh, even though you probably have some upgrades we could probably give you. Uh, maybe not. Combine. Oh, we have quite a few more things here, too. I like that. And do you have upgrades? Yes, you have to be offensive. Maybe we'll raid Cheetah. We'll try it. It's probably not going to go very well. Oh, they're losing over here, which is not good, too, but whatever. Um, These are the divisions that we're using. We're going to duplicate this. Call them 20s. Right? 20s. And do we have anything in spare? Spare reserves. Oh, we got, a, we got more guns. We don't have a lot of artillery, but that's okay. If we have extra guns, let's go and make... Uh, give them more guns. Um, that's not bad. It's not great, but I'd rather have 14 combo with anything else, so... There you go. Whatever. 
Oh, the Victor Revolution victorious? We are victorious, and you go to sit in our prison. Awaiting his fate, we have proven our strength and will, will on the battlefields of Siberia, and we can now transform our region into a worker's dream. Let those who doubted our chances of success be crushed by the boot of Dalianism. Nevertheless, our territory has been ravaged by war, and much of the infrastructure we have had was damaged. Our nation must now begin the reconstruction of the land, and it's build a state much like the old Soviet state under Lenin. And we want to unify the motherland, and help the struggling Russians being oppressed by dictators and mismanagement by inept democracies. We must create a strong union that can fight for them. It is also necessary. We create a model province to show our enemies that we are the only ones who can create a perfect Russia. No one can stop the masses from achieving the goals in the end. Absolutely. Um, I do want to raid them. Let's see what happens. I'm going to risk it. It's probably a bad idea to do this, and it's probably really bad. Try the NKVD. Stoke the fires. Oh, that's that one first. Let us promote our revolutionary ideals to make a better society. People have become lethargic and fearful because of the brutality and terror tactics of Yagoda. But cruelty is not what socialism should be about. The workers should love the government, not be scared of it. Socialism is not the dread of what punishment is to come, but the anticipation of what reward is to be made. For socialism to work in it, it is in dire need of the support of the people. This is where Yagoda failed, but we will, of course, succeed. To achieve this, we will need some sort of propaganda. We must appear as a loving and caring government to the populace. Posters will be around every corner, and the radios will be filled with revolutionary messages. Like Likewise, we must also give more rights in, to the laborers and the factories and farms. We will have support in no time. Doubt. Salvin would have preferred to get married by the sea, but he'd had to be satisfied with Lake Baikal. Leaving his new wife, Nadizia, asleep in the compartment, he stepped into the corridor of the train carriage that bore him back to Vernudinsk. Outside, or maybe Vernudinsk. Outside, the pine trees rushed by under the light of the full moon. Gazing into the forest for a moment, Sovin opened the window and was instantly assaulted by the freezing wind and the noise of the train's passage, lighting a cigarette. A rare luxury, he leaned against the walls of the carriage, exhaling occasionally out into the night. After a while, the door to the neighboring compartment uh, slid open. Hair tussled, Pachiro stepped into the corridor. Wordlessly, he offered her a cigarette. Waving it off, she said, having trouble sleeping, Valera. Sovin uh, blew a thin stream of smoke out of the window. He couldn't meet the eyes of his friend as he said, uh, Ah, Susanna, I should be happy. This is my wedding night. I, I'll ever do, but I just feel... Nothing. Sovin looked up at Pachiro, tears filling his eyes. I keep thinking, how will it end? Will we face the most overwhelming obstacles and every day I send men to die bloodly and horrible deaths? What gives me the right to, Susanna? I have such doubts. Pachiro laid her hand slightly on Sovin's shoulder. Nothing worth having is without its price, Valera. When you doubt, find your courage and remember that we fight for what is true and right. We believe in you, and so does every man, woman, and child in Russia who still hopes for the future. Above all else, Valera, remember the revolution and be true to yourself. Wiping his face, Valera smiled through his tears. Suzanne, I think, sometimes that you are the strongest of us all. Looking into each other's eyes, the two old friends smiled at one another as a train carried them into the night. Love has a ring, and a ring has no end. Unless you destroy it. Anyways, Dreams of Freedom. Ooh, I forgot about that one. Uh, where are we at? So it looks like we're going to go to two-year draft. So right now, where are we at? Service by requirement, huh? So we're here. Two oh, wow. So we're literally on service by requirement? Ooh, that's, that's not good. We're going down to two-year draft, man. Are you kidding me? Um, I mean, technically we get more... Oh, man. So we get 10 more stability. We get 10 more... 10% 10 more war support. Wow, that gives, hurts our political power by so much. 0.4 more political power, 5% more research speed, we get 10% more division organization, 10% more recovery rate, 20% more factory output as well as dockyard output, and then literally 20% more construction output. Holy crap, you know what? I don't want to lose manpower, so... Uh, oh, I forgot to train divisions. God dang it. <laughs> My bad. Jesus. But at least we'll get some political power from here on out, so that's nice. Stoke the fires in our hearts. I do want more stability. That'd be really good in our homes. We're going to do in our homes. As the triumphant revolution marches on, we cannot ever forget the rights of the workers that which form the very bedrock of our socialist ideals. Even now, the working men and women of Baratia languish under old laws from decades past and are forced to make do with barely functioning industrial sectors. With the comrades and labor crying out for justice, the time has come to rush to their aid. And I apologize for this, but I'm going to go and select some of this other stuff before we finish reading that. Just because we need to get some of this stuff done and get some better artillery. The General Secretary shall work to personally ensure that the rights of the worker and the new union are guaranteed. All these reforms, however, will be for naught if our people cannot find work. To remedy this, we must begin a large-scale overhaul of our dilapidated factories to both provide ample work opportunities for the people and bring our industry back to life. In the end, all of our efforts will serve as a powerful statement of our new government's goals. The union will always fight full. The working man, a hero in the family. Sullivan had really done it. He had won. You go and the rest of his corrupt NKVD dudes had finally gotten what was coming to them. Even as Baldreb received the this news with barely contained glee. He also felt very strongly concerned. 
Too many of Salvin's soldiers would never return home, and he had seen more than one weeping widow or grieving parent since the war had ended. The only question was, it remaining was, would he be among them? In the middle of the day, as Baldureb was washing dishes at the sink, a knock came at the door. He nearly dropped the plate he was holding into his, in his excitement. He wasn't expecting any visitors. Rushing to the door, he threw it open, and could have almost cried at the sight of that greeted him. There was his son, decked out in one of the finest uniforms Salvin's forces had to offer, with a big grin plastered across his face. I'm home, Papa, his son said. His voice almost cracking, I'm finally home. They embraced with Baldureb patting his son on the back to comfort, comfort him. And biting his son aside, Baldurev called over his wife, who was similarly overjoyed to see her son alive and well. They sat their son down with all the food he could want, and listened to him as he told his best stories of the conflict, concluding that with the fact that he had been appointed by one of Salvin's guards for distinguished service. For all Baldurev cared, Baldurev, yeah, he could have been a deserter. He was just glad to see his son that his son was okay. In the end, nothing else really mattered. So what is this? So, uh, influence of the Salvin wing is very high. Bukharinus wing is very high. Ooh. A Leninist economy. We do get more political power, but... Oh. That's not bad. Stage 1. Switch economic reform stage 2. Ooh. I kind of like this stuff. Um, The work of the party in the Communist Southern is not yet done. Though they were able to form a united front against the NKVD. Decide the form of freedom that will bring the people of Russia. Uh, Comrade Selvin's own interpretation of Leninism is seen by many as a more humane option than Bukharin's reforms, but the effectiveness of the latter cannot be overstated. Whatever the people decide, Comrade Selvin will follow their will. Making sure to finish the reforms before the start of the first reformed congress. They'll be unavailable onwards. Oh, finish the reforms before the start of the first congress. Oh, okay, in our homes. Um, well, we got. I think we have a while, right? So, uh, workers' councils, libertarian socialists. I like this one. Light centralization seems like a lot of fun. So, if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. Oh, that's really nice too. That's not bad. I gotta go with light centralization because we get another civvy. And we get more political power. I do want to empower the Bukharinist wing because I'm pretty sure the last time I'm more than certain I went with the Sabinat wing. So we'll go with the light centralization. Our revolution has achieved much on top, and the tyrant who had once terrorized these lands, and our victory has no doubt given much needed hope and optimism to the oppressed peoples of the Far East. Now, however, it's becoming clear that the situation is not any less dire than it was before our victory. We must learn to accept that our position is still far from secure, and one false move could place all of our achievements in jeopardy. Therefore, the centralized authority that we established during the rebellion must be remain as is, to allow us to more effectively safeguard the revolution. Some of the council may see this temporary policy as a betrayal of the ideals we champion so loudly. Great reforms are indeed on the horizon, but for the now, we must first take every precaution necessary to ensure that our young union, of course, does survive. Um, is there any way we can raid for anybody? I want to raid people. One day out, raid them out. What are you doing that? That's not bad. We need a lot of stuff. We actually have 19 guns. Look at that, huh? So the light centralization will be good. Followed up with, trying the NKVD. The time has come. The top of officers of the infamous secret police force that served as a terror of so many for so long will finally be put on trial in the people's court. Justice will be served, but unlike our enemies, we have we have elected to do so with fairness and honesty. They will be prosecuted like any other, and we give them the chance to defend themselves. Although these men would never show us the same mercies given the chance, we must prov prove to the people that we are not the same monsters that once re reigned in Irkutsk. By avoiding a humiliating show trial in the kangaroo court, we will be demonstrating that both friend and foe will be given the benefit of the doubt, and that justice will always prevail in our new Russia. How are you guys looking after you? You're looking not too bad, really, so. I don't want to train him yet, but still. Hard choices. Valerie saw him and worked his fingernails between the two sheets of paper, plucking a report from the top of the stack and shifting the one he had just looked over the to the bottom of the pile. He glanced up at his advisors, who eagerly awaited the general secretary's decision on the matters enclosed. Shifting his gaze back downwards, he began to read the report on the status of the proletariat. A slew of various re retellings of industrial accidents, worker complaints, safety hazards, and calls for employment laid upon the page. Unemployment was up, and accidents were down in number, but up in severity, and the masses overall seemed to be suffering. Calmly sipping his coffee, Sovereign scrutinized the report for ten minutes while thick, tense silence hung in the air around the ASSR officials. Lastly, Sovereign came to the end of the third page as a tidy list, uh, little list of two options. One simple plan to increase regulation and improve workplace democracy. Another, brush pushed by Braun, was to work on increasing infrastructure, reasoning that the improvements to the society would make their way down to the workers. The General Secretary cut the silence with a concise report. Focus on infrastructure versus improve the lives of the workers. As much as I want to do that one, we gotta go this way. Ben Udinsk. Thank you. Moderate. Very high. Oh, there goes you go, Daddy Slavia. Oh, yes. Oh, and Ming Jing is one. Mm. And I know I'm going to hate this already. Trying to fight the Divine Mandate sucks. So much booty. God, I just want to raid, man. At least you guys are getting raided, too. Look at that. But if not, that's fine. 
I forget. Oh, reunification of Russia? No. We gotta wait for that. That's gonna take a while to do. Has Burgundy finally done it? We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I love Warlord of Villain. Not really. No, I don't love it. That's a waste of PP. You wanna save your PP for the next stage, because that's when you really wanna blow your PP, which sounds really weird to say, but whatever. Rebuild the factories. As much as I wanna do that one. Repair the roads. Oh, that's so good to do. I've gotta do that one. Repair the roads. Much of the. Siberian infrastructure was also destroyed in the uprising against Yagoda, and many soldiers are calling for repairing the roads to maintain steadfast positions in the upcoming wars. Sovereign does have the power to override the Soviet Council's calls to repair the factories to help the revolution spread further. Should he override the Soviet Council's recommendation, this sets a precedent that the state's power lies in Sovereign, which he feels is a betrayal of the workers. At the same time, the rebuilding the infrastructure would help in spreading the revolution to our neighbors. General meeting or General Committee meeting number 24. A strike of a gavel turned the hashed clamor of the pact or the pact committee meeting to silence. The officers, oh, officials gathered in the packed opera house watched with anticipation as a general secretary took up the stage, approaching a studio podium and clearing a throat before leaning into the microphone. Following a brief report on the minutes of the previous meetings as well as a few token proposals on the small issues, a group of Russians got down to brass tacks. And with that, I will now open the floor to my comrades in the committee. Does anyone have a motion that they would like to raise? Almost immediately after Salvin had finished talking, an older man stood up and shakily produced a copy stained sheet of paper. Adjusting his spectacles, he began to read out a simple proposal on centralizing a slightly to remain stable during these dire times. The pitch, in its entirety, was effectively to get more power to Salvin as an emergency measure to protect the state. The motion was probably seconded and passed with a comfortable majority, and the meeting continued as normal. A necessary step to save us all. Oh, Guiana. Hello, Guiana. Oh, let's see. Workers' Council would be nice with the Torch of Hope. Nice. The fate of Yagoda. The People's Judgment. The fate of the NKVD. The remnants of the Yagoda's oppressors who had been unable to flee westwards were sent to Vaknudinsk. In the middle of the night, and cattle cars shuffled along the Trans-Siberian like so many other gulag-bound victims before them. One by one, they were hauled before the courts, found guilty of crimes against the revolution and the people, and dragged back to the cells. In the gallery, gallery the people howled for blood before they were silenced by the tribunal. Watching from the bench, some could not help but feel their pain. All have lost someone they loved to the NKVD. As the sun began its descent, and the last of the trials of individuals concludes, the tribunal faces a second and most unarguably more important item on the agenda. What to do about the NKVD organization as a whole? Frothing at the mouth, the more radical mutineers argued that the NKVD must be totally dissolved, for its history was a tool, as a tool, of state of suppression and Yugodian tyranny. Though agreeing with them on principle, Slavin also finds himself drawn to the arguments of Braun and other Bolsheviks, who insist in quiet but firm voices that the NKVD is too valuable as a tool to cast aside, that it ought to be reintegrated as a security force of the ASSR on a tight leash. Slavin away the sins of the NKVD and against its potential use to the revolution as the debates raged on. The NKVD had done so much evil, but could it really be rehabilitated? Could it even be just what they needed for the revolution to prevail? Comrade Solomon cried Pichiro, startling, out, startling him out of his reverie. We have not heard yet heard from you. What should we done about your good as dogs? The crimes cannot be forgotten. They can still serve the revolution. Mm, why can we do this one? Hmm. Uh, we can't do that one yet, but this one we can't do. Has not yet committed to an ideology. Uh, are these... We have these available... We have no PP, right? Yeah. Do we have to have a high, higher... Oh, maybe... We need to... Hmm. Does not have a national spirit? A Leninist economy stage one... Oh! No? Yeah, we don't have that. Yeah. Um... Has not committed yet to an ideology. Yeah. Well, we'll see, I guess, later on. United forever. Six Emperor Tyrannus. Who else begin to turn? I like that one, too. Factory output in our hearts. We'll have to study reform. Place of dominoes. The Revolutionary Woman. It's not bad. Chance of Redemption? Um, if you wonder about that, please go right ahead. What a chance of redemption. The trial is over, and since, there, since then, there have been countless debates over what to do with the remnants of the NKVD. During these debates, Comrade Braun proposed a rather controversial option. He insists that we still need some kind of special police force to ensure our revolution's long-term survival, and that incorporating the NKVD is necessary to fill this gap. This sentiment has been echoed by older Bolsheviks, who argue that reintegrating the NKVD in some form would be a great benefit to us. Although Comrade Salvin knows that the organization was responsible for the countless atrocities and injustices, he couldn't help but see the logic in Comrade Braun's words. Therefore, it is with a heavy heart that, that he has decided to begin the reintegration of the NKVD into a new government. This process will include a comprehensive restructuring of the organization, as well as further trials for members that have been found guilty of committing egregious crimes against the people. And to say that this move is controversial will be an understatement, but Salvin assures the skeptics in the Soviet Council that they have nothing to fear. Our new NKVD will be rebuilt from the ground up to help protect the people, not to 
terrorize them. Dogs in the hen house, only days after their trials, they walk the streets of Nudinsk, proudly in uniform with heads held high, knowing that they are as untouchable as they had been under Yagoda. A few days of hardship have been a small price to pay for the freedom, despite the rhetoric of Salvin's mutineers. To the men of the NKVD, it seemed as though they'd simply exchange one master for another. Staring out the window of his room into the street, Southern wondered if he had done the right thing. Mahiv and Braun finally conv convinced him that it was necessary to rehabilitate the NKVD for the aid they could provide him in liberating the rest of Russia, and that their uses outweighed the crime they committed. Southern tried to tell himself that it had not been his only solely his decision, but all he had done was share his opinions with his comrades, but they knew, he knew, he was grasping at straws, furrowing his brow, Salvin couldn't deny that his views as a nominal leader of the revolution carried an overwhelming sway, although Salvin knew he would never use the NKVD out that way that Yagoda had. It was not so easy to convince the people of that. He noticed the questioning glances his more radical comrades gave him now, the way sometimes talk would stop as he entered the room. Most of all, he couldn't get, forget the look of hurt betrayal on Susanna's face when he spoke in the trial in favor of reintegrating the NKVD, thinking, or taking a deep sigh. Salvin steadied himself. No, he hadn't the time for doubt. He made the right decision. They needed the skill in training these men to carry the torch of the revolution. Finally, feeling ready to face the central committee, Salvin stomped downstairs into the street and tried to ignore the looks he got from the people who had once looked to him as their salvation. The hardest thing to do and the right thing to do are often the same. Optimism and anarchy. The streets of the Ulan Ud were filled with a palpable sense of optimism. The people of the Burat ASSR were of a strange breed in the anarchy of the former Soviet Union. Where much of the people of Russia had become jaded and disillusioned with life and the anarchy, the people of Salvin's state were idealistic in their extreme. Perhaps even more surprisingly was the fact that their idealism was not blind to the realities of the world. They knew how unfair the world was, but they fought against the darkness of it regardless. As a stranger walked through the streets, observing the, often, the excitement and happiness that surrounded him, he could not help but be caught up in in it himself. He was no socialist, but at the same time he could not help but understand the appeal. As he walked, a man in the uniform of Salvin's Red Army approached him, hands well away from his weapons. Greetings, comrade. What brings you to our fair city? He questioned with a smile. The stranger was struck by just how genuine it seemed to be. I'm simply passing through. I'll be seeking lodgings for the night before moving on. I'm heading east, he replied. He saw no reason to lie to the man. Unlike in Yagoda's territories, he was unlikely to be murdered for saying the wrong thing. Very well, comrade. I'd recommend you go down to Main Street for three blocks. On the left side of the street, there is a small hotel. Better for the travelers like yourself. Uh, if you don't mind asking, what brings you to the Far East? In truth, I don't know. Not really. I, I've wandered Russia for years. It's just another trek for me. He knew exactly what he sought, yet he doubted he would ever find it. Hmm, a strange thing to hear in these times. Oh, well, how rude of me. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Sergeant Victor Sheikhov. It was a pleasure to meet you. My name's Alexander. Good to meet you. Thank you for your advice. The stranger said as he began to walk down the street, a slight smile on his face. Of course, my friend. Uh, adrift on the tide of memory. Otto Braun shuffled through the streets towards the opera house, breath steaming before him in the grayness before dawn. Rheumatic old knees aching and a harsh Siberian core, boots scrunching morning frost that covered the cobbles like the pale on his soul. Braun delved. It's pelagic. Depths of his memory, all these years later, his exile from Germany so lodged in his heart like a cruel dagger, the calendar had sliced years from his life, and still the pain did not fade. The dim years after his flight from prison in 28 had been marked by failure and pain, first by the annihilation of his communist allies in China, then by the collapse of the Soviet Union into a thousand bickering shards, and still it worsened as he learned from the slow tide of information that rolled over the shattered Russia that his once lover, Olga, had been murdered in the Nazi death camps. She had burned so bright, and the fascists had snuffed the flame within her like they had done with so many others. He had loved her, loved how she made him feel. He could still feel the thrill when she'd helped break him out of prison, and the memories of their evenings together in Moscow kept him warm on so many cold Siberian nights. All was dust now, Lenin's dream lay crushed, and Olga moldered in a mass grave. Braun felt diminished, withered, broken against the wheel of time's tor tormentous, relentless advance. He contemplated ending his torment once more than once. Then Sabin and Petruro had come to him in Irkutsk, speaking of revolution, of making Lenin's dream live again. They were children, vainly idealistic, and yet he couldn't help but become their mentor. What else was left to him? He would happily give his life for, for even the slightest chance that socialism might rise from the ashes like a phoenix. And yet, no matter how many years had passed, Olga's face would be forever burned into his mind's eye, beaming as she'd been during from their dash from their prison through the icy fields of distant Saxony. Give me the waters of Leth that numb the hot, and still I will be unable to forget you. And now, the Sabin wing is very low, and the, but the Bukharina swing is very high. So we get this one. Instead of the Sabin economy, or a Leninist economy, it becomes a Bukharinist economy. I don't think it's as good as the other one, but still. And we have army reforms as well, which I think are better. Because we get more attack and division organization. Also, we're doing the wheels begin to turn. 
Can you hear it, comrades? The factories are alive with the sound of machinery and power tools at work. The roads are busy with traffic once more, and the workers are once again toiling away to create a better future for all of us. Yet again, we've accomplished the impossible, and our efforts have imbued new life into the region. Soon, the industrial power potential of the entire region will be fulfilled to its utmost, and we'll have a strong base from which we can continue to spread the revolution across Russia, most importantly of all, however. The common folk of Barati have been finally been able to live better lives, with plenty of jobs available for all. The people have finally been emancipated from the lingering dread of poverty and hunger. The wheels of labor have begun to turn, and soon there will be no stopping them any time soon. Ah, the fate of Yugoda. The tyrant lies defeated. The terror in the night, reduced to a fearful husk cowering in a cell. The revolution has begun anew, finally saved from traitorous and vile men. Now the unspoken question lingers in the air. What comes next? Comrade Braun, often struggling to compose himself, has strongly indicated his wishes to see the monster executed. In private talks with Sablim, he passionately argues his case. It would be a disrespectful case or a task to those murdered to allow such a man to live. And exceedingly dangerous, according to him, you go to must serve as a symbol to all who would dare subvert the will of the masses to fulfill their own petty ends. However, Comrade Pachuro has emerged with a different approach, believing that an execution will forever solely the moral character of the new state. <clears throat> Pachuro argues instead for a lifetime imprisonment. According to her, the new union must rise above the barbarism of the past, and in addition, she believes imprisonment sets no a less effective an example. Ultimately, the choice falls on Solomon's shoulders. Each day we remain undecided is another we anger all people. Something must be done with the old, old oppressor. The People's Judgment, if you want to read about that, please go right ahead. But we're going to go with Sick Sempatoranus. We're going to shoot the dude and get it over with. There's no place in the Union for to come for murders or death spits in the name of every brave dissident and tortured soldier. We can finally end this madness. It is true that much blood has already been spilled, but crimes egregious as these deserve something more than a luxurious imprisonment in which we get slightly, not much more, but slightly more authoritarian socialism and then we'll be doing United Forever. We're, we're a lot more political power. 15%. The trial again could go to... Gaze burning with vitriol, you go to scowl at Sablin from the dock. His pitted face twisted with contempt. Undaunted, Sablin stared right back. They decided to hold the trial in the opera house, so as many people could be packed in as possible. Braun's voice echoed in the cavernous space as he read out the list of the tyrant's crimes. Through it all, you go to an inflinch very much at all. Genrik Grigoryevich, you go to this court of soldiers and workers find you guilty of all charges laid against you now that you are finally responsible. Do you feel the slightest regret for the vile crimes you committed against Russia and her people? Braun looked down at Yugoda, trying his best not to smug, or look smug. Yugoda turned his head fractionally to look up at Braun. When he spoke, he, it was as though his words were being dredged from the sediment of the depths of Lake Baikal itself. Yes, I am sorry. I am very sorry that when I had the chance, I did not shoot you all. Braun smirked Doc and as he took his seat. Now let it be known that the accused expresses no remorse. Now as to the matter of punishment. While well, the court debated, Sablin stared into Yagoda's eyes and tried to make sense of what he saw there in his time. In Yagoda's service, Sablin had never met the man, and had formed an image in his mind of a colossal statuesque figure beyond simply humanity. Simple humanity. It was simpler and easier to fight that entity than the short, haggard man who sat half sunken in the dock. Why had he become so hollow with hate? What led him to bathe his hands in so much blood? Sublin felt a raging urge to see Yagoda extinguish as much for his, his crimes he'd committed for as a grim vision of what he could become if he gave into the power's black temptation. And so, when Yagoda's sentence was announced five years in a prison farm, Sublin's jaw clenched insufficient. That man was a tyrant, a murderer, a plunder, an enemy to everything right and pure. Consumed by a sudden wildness, Sablin yearned to leap forward, drag your goat out into the mud, and give him a, the justice he deserved. Hold on. Give in. Give in. You must give in to your hate. Because we are now united forever. The symphony of equality slowly building under crescendo. The once heavy air weighing down on the common man's broad shoulders has assumed the light and form. Long sealed lips begin to sing as free expression returns to life on the shores of Lake Baikal. The people, long cynical in their attitudes, have begun to feel a revived kinship once again, all of which truly become comrades without coercion, brutality, betrayal. The people find faith in an inevitable goal. While fully healing our scars may take some time, our progress towards the liberation of the proletariat and the restoration of legitimacy has begun. 50% more political power, more division recovery, and more division defense, which makes our soldiers quite, quite strong, I would say. Quite, quite strong. As we do have... We're mobilizing more. That is not a deal. Hmm... There you go. Keep as many as you can in the reserves. Very good. And they'll do in our hearts after we do United Forever. The leader's justice. Clenching his fist, Sablin stood. Instantly, the opera house fell silent. Every head turning to him, swallowing to get over the crest of his emotion. Sablin pointed at a pair of guards. You two, take him. Outside. For a moment, the men did not move. Fearfully. They flicked their eyes between Braun and Sablin. Then, with no contradictory orders, they each grabbed you by an arm. As Sablin strode forward, the crowd before him partied. Parted silently like the Red Sea before Moses. 
quashing the tiny voice within him that begged him to turn back, Soblin thrust the doors open, stalking into the howling winds, his breath steaming before him. The gods dragged Yagoda outside and dumped him in the frozen mud. Determined to maintain some sort of dignity, Yagoda pushed himself to his knees and wiped his face clean. Watching from the doorway, the crowd of Soblin's followers saw some exchange of words with a defeated tyrant, but they could not overhear the here over the screaming wind. After a moment, his face as tranquil and undisturbed as a surface of Lake Baikal, Sabin pulled out his Tokarev service pistol and pumped two rounds in Yagoda's head. As a spume of blood and brain matter sprayed from the back of his skull, Yagoda's corpse slowly sagged to the ground, crumpling as he bled into the mud. Sabin stared down into the Terran's lifeless eyes as they gazed emptily into the grey uh, crepuscular sky. Panting with exertion, Pachiro pushed out of the crowd, out through the crowd. Immediately, she came to a halt at what she saw. Valera, she whispered, what have you done? You have, you have executed him. Still holding his pistol, Soblin sharply glanced up at her and muttered, the tyrant has not been executed. He has been shot. Hot tears streaming down her cheeks, Pachiro said, Valera, there are songs in this world other than vengeance and despair. With those two bullets, we are doomed. How can we, anyone believe we will not repeat his tyrannies? Oh, Valera. As a warm, false warmth of his hate abandoned him, Southern fell into the icy clutches of doubt. An eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. And sometimes we need a blind world. And in our hearts, there's no other place to start than by improving the lives of our people socially. Our society is still marred in the traditions of the Tsars. This is a huge issue for our parents to the other warlords. And if we want to be a Lenin state, we have to look like one. We must take care of this problem at once. Women deserve rights just like men. Our old traditions must be destroyed to pave the way towards progress. We cannot let the people be oppressed any longer. Once we have achieved socialism or the social revolution, there will be no stopping what is right. If people have more rights, they will work harder. The ancient beliefs and customs that are not compatible with socialism will be ended. After all, everyone must be equal if we want to accomplish the revolution. Ah, uh, hopefully we get more PP here. Please give us more PP. The shackles broken. The place of women in the revolution have been a question for many socialist movements, ours among them. Our female comrades have been just as oppressed by the specter of capitalism as men, if not more so. Why can't they fight on the front lines or, as, or work as medics in the field hospitals? We shall promptly decree an order to make women equal to men in, in army capacity. Female battalions will be, stapled to be a staple of our army. All people are comrades, not just the men, but the women too. Our enemies will fear our female soldiers just as much as any man. Oh, we get to stage two. And we still could do that one eventually. Stage two is not bad. It's okay. It's not great. And reforms. I like more attack and more reinforcement organization. That's very good, actually. It's very, very good. In our hearts. All hands on deck soon. City reformed. Empower the Southern. If you want to read about this, please go ahead. And there you go. But. Place the dominoes. Comrade Sullivan has stated his views on the matter of many times. A revolutionary woman or woman is to be equal to the revolutionary man. However, unlike many of his other contentions, these claims have fallen on mostly deaf ears. The Soviet people, desperate and embroiled in chaos, have adopted quite a few reactionary attitudes over these last few decades. In addition, centuries of traditional Russian link Russian Russian culture has aided few ch in challenging these thoughts. While the goals of Comrade Petro and other feminist figures are undi undeniably ad admirable, they're also incredibly naive. Our fledging state was created to represent the will of the masses, not simply to force doctrines upon them from above. Instead of hasty and radical policy that is sure to cause backlash, Comrade Braun has proposed more gradual reforms. The people must become warm to revolutionary morals, not be thrust into them. Hopefully, a policy change such as this will at least eventually lead to gender equality, as opposed to the harmful reactionary resistance. More stability? We still get some good stuff here too. Good, 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 good. And we got to start really just working on land auction. Uh, I usually do this one, which is usually pretty darn nice. So, very good. Weaponry wise, we need way more anti tank. We do have six divisions here, which is pretty nice, but still, go and train. We have plenty of motorized though. Artillery's looking pretty bad. Guns are looking pretty bad, but that's alright. All hands on deck. Chin and resting on his hand. Soblin listened to this comrade's savage debate the status of women. Oh, look at that. In the revolution, of course. Letting the words wash over him, Soblin recalled that Lenin had always said women were crucial to the revolution, something that many chauvinistic communists preferred to ignore. Until recently, he had given little thought to the issue, preoccupied as he was, but Petron Olanos Olanovskaya had given him a lot to think about. If they were to create a new Russia where men and women were equal in every way, shouldn't women be able to serve in combat if they were so close or so, so choose to do so? Making a decision, Soblin shot to his feet. Comrades, he boomed, cutting through the din, immediately silenced every face turned to him. Are these attitudes towards women not reactionary? Lenin said women are as important as men in achieving the triumph of the revolution, and it is our duty to ensure that they have the freedom to choose how they may serve their cause. If the women of Russia wish to hold a rifle for the revolution, we should let them. 
Taking a seat, Salvin sensed the effect his words had on his audience, like an electric current running through the air. Sitting across from him, Petruo shot him a grim. In a few minutes, the Central Committee voted unanimously to allow women full equality in service to the revolution. Soldiers were sent running through the streets, calling the news to all, and before the day was out, masses of women flooded the opera house, demanding to be enlisted. Standing on the stage with his hands on his hips, Salvin looked down with satisfaction into the chaos of the pit. Beside him, Petruo amiably draped her armor on his shoulder. Ah, Valera, I knew you'd do the right thing. All women to arms. Yeah, you can die just like the men. The revolutionary woman. Beyond any policy argument or proposed reforms, it's clear that socialism benefits all. With the destruction of bourgeois property relations, the expansion of welfare and the reordering of society, conditions are rapidly changing, no longer forced to pry an existence from the hands of their masters. The women of the Soviet Union enjoy many benefits, freed from the wage labor. They now have time for jovial pursuits. Adequate attention can now be safely given to family, career, and duty happiness. In addition, mothers no longer suffer the indignity of working along the child. Public schooling and relaxed quotas have ensured a better upbringing and an end to any ch lingering child labor. The extent of her policies may vary, but it is undeniable that socialist women have become emancipated by the revolution. More recruitable population factor, recovery rate, stability, war sport, what's not to love? And the torch of hope. Dreams are, of course, a fickle thing. In their time, they wield unrivaled power. Dreams triumph over all reason, manipulating reality itself to suit their whims. Indeed, dreams are influential actors. However, they find themselves no match for the morning sun, fading like a distant mirage into its yellow horizon. The people of Lake Baikal have awoken, and for the first time in their history, the dream is not receded. What started as an impassioned speech in a radio tower has grown into a massive movement. A simple rebellion the spark needed to revive the social spirit, we have achieved one seemingly impossible task, and with the end of tyranny, we march towards another. Reunification will not be easy, but it will be necessary. Let us carry the torch of hope across the east, or the dreams of October will not fade this, this day. The Domino said, Today was a day that will truly go down in the history of Baratia, and hopefully Russia as a whole. Crowds are gathered around a training camp, men, women, and children, all waiting in hushed, heavy silence, or a low babble of conversation. The word had spread organically enough, although some occasionally mentioned on the radio and in the papers. Some, resistant to change, had dreaded it, while others had warily, warily, but well opened, openly welcomed this progress. Today, five soldiers will become the first women of the first revolutionary warlord state to pass. Combat training and receive full colors and rank as official members of the army. So this desperate throng of people stood and waited the news. Reporters stood calmly, scratching down descriptions poetic, informative, and or anything in between the papers. Women and girls stood eagerly, afraid to voice their excitement but watching like hawks. Old men grumbled much more candidly, exchanging their discomfort with the change. All were silent, however, when five women exited the small building in full uniform. After moments of cautiously judging the atmosphere, the cheers and jeers erupted from the mixed crowds as the soldiers made the way to the new christened women's barracks. Most were civil, rose was tossed, but it, as was a stone. The women kept their resolve, and soon the day continued as any other day, with one change. Many were left pondering to, on both their uh, potential and previous prejudices. No one could be sure what would happen next, but one thing is certain, times are changing. Progress, baby steps on. And the torch of hope. The revolution waits for no one. Which I want to rate other people, man. Can we rate? And, and I know someone's going to already ask me here, like, why did I not use this picture? Also, off screen, like, between the fade and fade out, these guys already tried to rate us earlier, so that's why it looked like we, we were taking a while with this stuff, but yeah. Um, yeah, these guys were rating us, so. But someone's going to ask me, like, why don't you use this picture? Because I've used them before. It's not bad, but I wanted to use the other picture to be, just be a little bit different, so. I hope you like the thumbnail. It's very nice. And there goes Pot of Madagascar. Seems like in the next episode. The Germans might have a potential small, tiny, tiny, tiny civil war. Go suck yourself, Siberian Black Army. Would you look at this daddy? Stepan Valentiev oh, attacking Ilya Baldinov. 2v1, I like these odds. Ah, oh, look at that, beautiful. Ah, oh, very good. Thank you. This guy's actually pretty darn good, even though he's Field Marshal, so... No wonder he's pretty good. Huh. Actually, I don't want you. I want someone who has more attack. Uh, balance it out. Boris. Sutsuki. Oh, these guys are killing each other, too. Look at that. Scavenge for loot. Oh, yes, please. Oh, get it on that one, too, but whatever. Yeah, it's alright. Alright, the revolution waits for no one. Sullivan rose with his son, eventually making his way downstairs and into the street. Though most had gone to bed, there were still a few stragglers trying to keep last night's party going. Stopping at a wa water pump, Sullivan washed the morning foulness out of his mouth and shuffled into the opera house. Promising himself never to touch vodka again. Ha, <laughs> what a lie. The enormous theater was almost empty. Rubbing his eyes, Sobin mounted the stage to greet the co Central Committee. Sitting around their meeting table, his closest com comrades were sipping from glasses of vodka. Makiv waved the bottle in his direction. A bit of the hair of the dog that bit you, Comrade Sobin. Smiling, Sobin poured himself a splash of vodka and down in a single gulp. I told you he lied. Oh, no, I'm awake. Well, shall we discuss the liberation of the East? Sobin was unable to suppress his laughter as his comrades turned as one 
to glare at him bitterly. He knew he ought to be as hungover as them, but he was also so flushed with energy after last night when the results of the referendum to proclaim or reclaim Siberia for the revolution had come in. Unsurprisingly, the people voted overwhelmingly in favor of liberating all the peoples of Russia as they had opposed. As the oppressed peasants of Rakusk face down on the table, Petro groaned and slowly raised her head. A map of the Far East stuck to her cheek. Valera, can't this wait until tomorrow? I'm not much good at the revolution with my heads hammered like this. Greeting impish, impishly. Sullivan filled everyone's glasses of vodka. Comrades, the revolution waits for no one now, Comrade Braun, regarding the Eastern fascists. Man was born for love and revolution. Spreading the revolution. Comrades, the time for liberation is nearly at hand. Now that we have settled accounts with the goat and consolidated our position, we must now focus our gaze beyond our borders. To the east, the situation has grown out of control. White Tsar's officers continue to champion the hopeless cause of the monarchism with the Pat Tsar and Cheetah, while the warlords of Amir and Magadan brazenly declare open alliance or allegiance to the fascist ideals. The Ottoman foes of socialism right, lie right literally on our doorstep, and thus we must prepare for the inevitable conflict that will decide once and for all who controls the Russian Far East. While we prepare ourselves for war, it may be necessary to look for nearby warlords we can make common cause with, for we will need all the help we can get ridding the region of the fascist scum once and for all, but I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow as we will fight the fascists further east of us. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.